Did the CIA kill our president in 1963? Yeah, maybe. I know how crazy that sounds. I'm the guy who chose to do the first episode of Time Suck mocking the lizard Illuminati conspiracy theory. I privately mocked conspiracy theories and theorists for years. Never saw the Oliver Stone film JFK because I knew it was a movie about Oswald not being responsible for JFK's assassination, and that kind of stuff always irritated me. But... I try to be open to any logical conclusions I find as I research these episodes, and well, goddammit, I think there's a good chance our own government had it in for our president and may very well have pulled the strings on the events that led to his death. So if you're a skeptic like me and you're rolling your eyes right now, I don't blame you. I get it. But hear me out. And if this is the first JFK Time Suck episode you're listening to, hit pause. Go back and listen to part one before you listen to this part two episode. Understand who Kennedy was and listen to some other theories about why he died, you know, such as the one that Oswald did in fact do it before you evaluate who you think may have killed Kennedy and why. And if you have heard part one, well, strap in and get ready for the who's really calling the shots wrap up edition of this John Fitzgerald Kennedy episode of Time Suck. You're listening to Time Suck. Happy Monday, everybody. I'm Dan Cummins, and thanks for listening to Time Suck, you time suckers, you glorious, curious, intellectually hungry, and beautiful, irreverent bastards. May your breasts hang high and your dicks hang low. Unless you unless you want your breasts to hang low and your dicks to rest high. Then you know what? You do you. You do you, mama. You rock your choice to the fullest. Excited for the big JFK wrap-up today during the 100th year anniversary of his birth. He was born May 29th, 1917. Uh, thank you to all you suckheads for the iTunes reviews, subscriptions, recommendations for others to listen. Clicking on Amazon button at timesuckpodcast.com to do your Amazon shopping. Throwing some bucks to the suck using that PayPal donation button and for buying those first and second generation tees at timesuckpodcast.com. Third generation tees at the printers now. Very excited. Trying to decide between puppy taint and a duckling eyelid for the fabric. Doing some tests to see, you know, which is softer. Hoping to announce uh, next week that it's ready. I think it will be. I think you're going to like it. Let's just say uh, it may feature Time Suck mascot Bojangles in all his magnificent glory. And maybe there's going to be a men's and a women's version this time. Because I know, you know, some of you ladies, you want a little want a little V-cut? You know, get the V-neck going? Show show the girls off a little bit? And I, you know what? If that's what you want to do, I think you should do it. So let's, uh, let's get right into this Kennedy wrap-up uh, right away this time. Uh, we're going to skip some of the thank yous by going straight in to a few JFK-specific Time Sucker updates. Updates. Get your Time Sucker updates. First update today is from Time Sucker Corey Oswald. He writes in saying, Hey, Dan, my name is Corey Oswald, and I just wanted to say I've been a longtime fan of the podcast and since episode one, and I love everything you have on Pandora. Well, thank you, Corey. It's very sweet of you. Uh, now that I'm done being a fanboy, all right, I like it, getting into it. I was watching a couple videos about the JFK assassination and found one where the video narrator, narrator was talking about how uh, Jackie wasn't trying to get out of the car or reaching for uh, United States Secret Service agent Clint Hill, but was actually reaching for a piece of John's skull fragment slash hair and then gets back into the seat. If you're as morbidly curious as I, just watch from frame 345 to 384, and he's referring to the Zapruder film there, And you see her grab for something. From frame 385 to 419, you can see Jacqueline uh, crawling back into the seat next to her dead husband just before the video ends. Hail Lord Nimrod and praise the God of Suck. Mm, Thank you, Corey. Uh, Yeah, you know, that that is something I came across that I didn't mention. And actually, uh, when you look into it, uh, when the Secret Service agent who was assigned to the president's car that day, Clint Hill, you know, the man seen in the Zapruder film, is rushing up to the back of the car. Uh, after JFK shot into the head, uh, he was asked in 2013, uh, why did Mrs. Kennedy come uh, up to the back of the car? And he said because she was trying to gather some of the material that came off the president's head and was on the back of the car. Now, that's Hill's firsthand assumption about her motive. But it's not like later that day he was able to ask her, you know, just, hey, uh, hey, Jackie, hey, uh, r- remember a couple of hours ago when your husband's brains were blown out in front of you and then you climbed out the back of the car? What the, what the fuck was that, was that all about? You know. But he was there, and that's what he assumed. So there is a chance that uh, in her shock, she was trying to put his head back together uh, and not, as others have assumed, and as I also stated, you know, trying to climb away from shooters in front of the car. 
Uh, yeah, because when you when you, do, when you watch the film, it does appear that Jackie, you know, there's a chance that she was just trying to grab something. And uh, Governor Connolly's uh, wife, Nellie, who sat in front of the First Lady, later recalled she heard Jackie screaming after, uh, you know, John was shot. Jack, Jack, they've killed my husband. I have his brains in my hands. So maybe she was actually literally just grabbing a chunk of his brains just in shock. I mean, what a fucking horrific thing to witness. How do you ever recover from that? Uh, Jackie would go on to remarry and live for many more years, but she must have been haunted for the rest of her life by those five terrible seconds in Dallas that changed the course of U.S. history. So yes, uh, when she when she uh, is heading towards the back of the car, there's a very, very good chance that she wasn't trying to escape any gunfire, but was just trying to literally grab a, a piece of her husband's head. Oh my God. Uh, this next one is uh, from Time Sucker, uh, Morgan McCaw. Said, I just listened to the most recent Time Suck on JFK. I kept waiting for you to reference this video made by Discovery Channel before they went full idiot. And that's a reference to the Megalodon when Discovery Channel was just started doing just crazy shit. Uh, they recreate the magic bullet shot with ballistics dummies and the same rifle and ammo to show it is entirely plausible. Uh, Carlos Hathcock is a fucking badass who might deserve his own time suck or share it with other legendary war heroes, and I'm surprised he is so skeptical of this performance at 80 yards. Not actually that far, and that's a reference to the first episode when I, when I say that he is, uh, as he did some fucking incredible shots in Vietnam. As a kid, I once shot a dragonfly out of the air with my pellet gun while it was flying around. I couldn't figure out where I hit it for about a minute until I realized I perfectly shot off its head. Was this a one in a million shot that wasn't exactly indicative of my skill? Yes. Is there a chance that Oswald got lucky and rolled a natural 20 in D&D terms on his assassination attempt? I would say so. Uh, love the D&D reference, Morgan. Um, God, it always felt so good. When I used to play D&D when you rolled that 20 when you're attacking. Just the fucking best. And yeah, that's a hell of a dragonfly shot. Um, okay, but back to what you're saying here. Um, back to his email. Uh, you also mentioned that critics, uh, say, say he didn't have any gunshot residue on his face. I'm not an expert on these things, but I know a decent amount about guns and I wouldn't expect a uh, gunshot residue to be on someone shooting a bolt action rifle like a Carcano. Uh, all the powder is long burned by the time a human can run the bolt and the muzzle is a long way from the shooter. Uh, excellent points, Morgan. Excellent points. Um, and I did watch that discovery channel and they, uh, you know, they, they do make an interesting case that the bullet from a shooter on a grassy you knoll would have obliterated JFK's head uh, as opposed to what actually did happen, where it blew just a little chunk off of the, the top. Um, also, while this video proves it, it couldn't be a shooter on the grassy you knoll, there are so many other videos that do prove it, it had to have been a, a shooter on the grassy you knoll. And actually, if, if you let the Discovery Channel video play to the end, <clears throat> uh, the very next video that comes up is a video from an episode of a 1988 British docuseries called The Forces of Darkness, uh, episode called The Men Who Killed Kennedy, and in it they interview a man named Gordon Arnold who was standing at the grassy knoll that day who claims to have heard the bullets definitely come from behind him on the grassy knoll. So while I did see uh, uh, videos such as uh, the one from Penn and Teller's old show, old show Bullshit that prove he was shot from behind where Oswald was, again, there was an equal number of convincing videos that do prove he was shot from the front. And, and that's just, you know, this, this, this whole JFK wormhole. For every video you can find that says one thing happened, you can find another convincing video that another thing happened. And so you just got to kind of like watch a bunch and then, you know, go with what you kind of feel in your gut is is more likely than the rest. Uh, yeah, just it's, it's, it's why everybody's still talking about JFK assassination because there's just, there's so many conflicting theories that people have researched very well and made a, a, a strong argument for. Uh, from Time Sucker, uh, Mike, this one, uh, Mike says, JFK is one motherfucker. And this is a, more of an inspirational one. This is cool. This is a little inspiration drawn from the adversity JFK overcame with all his health troubles and all the death he faced in the first episode. Remember, he lost his older brother uh, in World War II, uh, his only older sibling, just two years older, whom he was very close to. Uh, he lost a brother-in-law in the war. He lost his younger sister, Rose. She became an invalid from, uh, you know, essentially lost her. She, she became an invalid from a botched lobotomy in 1941. And she was the closest to him in age, just a year younger. And then the next sibling closest to him in age, Kathleen, just three years younger than him, uh, was killed right after the war in a plane crash in 1948. He himself nearly died right after the war, a war where he saved lives with some incredible acts of bravery. And then he had health problems, back surgery complications, you know, but he uh, still went on to become president. And yeah, he came from a wealthy family. Yes, he had opportunities. Many of us never have had, or, or nor will we ever have, but... He was also one tough, tenacious motherfucker of a man. And uh, that's what Mike's getting at. He says, hey, Dan, I'm a, I'm a BDM. And again, that's a fan of the fantastic Mediocre Time podcast, by the way. BDM stands for Big Dick Millionaire, a uh, term for the show's premium members. I uh, love that funny acronym. And he says, thank you for uh, putting this episode out. Uh, I had my girlfriend of five and a half years dump me four days after my birthday and a month before I was going to propose. Then three months later, 
Uh, I was hit with some horrible family news, which obviously made that seem minuscule, but yet threw my life into another whirlwind. I say all of that because as soon as I hit the 45-minute mark of the JFK Part 1 podcast, I realized I needed to stop being a fucking baby. JFK dealt with real life or death problems willingly, and I am just dealing with the problems of a normal, lucky, privileged guy. Thank you again. I love the fucking show, and truly thank you for letting me get this off my chest. Keep on sucking. Yeah, buddy, I like it. I like your take from that, Mike. You keep on sucking. Inspiration from JFK. Love it when we get something more than just uh, random trivia from these episodes. Uh, now let's see. You know what lessons we can all learn from today's information? Let's get out of these updates and get into the rest of this JFK. Thanks, time suckers. I needed that. We all did. Okay, today we're really going to explore why JFK may have been killed more than who specifically killed him, because odds are we're never going to know who the real killer was. And if you think, then why even listen? Well, because the machinery composed of people who may have wanted him dead is still very much alive today. And if this machinery, the military industrial complex, killed a president and never got caught, uh, and they're in control of our lives more than ever, uh, well, if we ever hope to kind of stop them, we need to learn what they've done, uh, what it says about our current nation and implications it has for our future. I feel like it's just some stuff to ponder on. Important stuff. So to understand the forces that may have conspired to kill Kennedy, we have to first understand the military industrial complex. And to understand that, we have to understand the Cold War and, and the groups that formed out of the Cold War, such as the CIA. All these groups were formed out of fear of communist expansion. So uh, Merriam-Webster uh, defines communism in its most basic terms as a theory advocating elimination of private property, a system in which goods are owned in common and are available to all as needed. It's essentially the opposite of capitalism, which Merriam-Webster defines as an economic system characterized by private or corporate ownership of capital goods by investments that are determined by private decision and by prices, production, and the distribution of goods that are determined mainly by competition in a free market. Uh, Bojangles defines communism as a bunch of silly old bullshit that inherently opposes the competitive nature of humanity, and then Bojangles raises his leg and takes a piss for further emphasis of his contempt and waves a fucking flag in favor of capitalism. That's that's Bojangles. Uh, basic, basically, in communism, uh, in theory, it, it, everyone works for the state, and then the state takes care of everyone equally. Now, again, in theory, uh, there's no lower, middle, or upper class in communism, no wealthy landowners, and then poor factory workers. Everyone's the same. Uh, and again, it's beautiful in theory. I think, I think I'd love to uh, you know, look at communism more deeply, and I, and I will in some future time sucks. Uh, we need to do some eventually about Stalin, Lenin, Karl Marx, Fidel Castro, uh, Rasputin, etc. Uh, in capitalism, if you can figure out how to make more money than your neighbor, you can buy 100 times the land you know he or she has, afford to send your kids to the schools that only the wealthy can afford. By God, you can, you can go grab that American dream and just take everything you want. Now, obviously, uh, this one can end up looking ugly in its extreme form also. You know, when it becomes a squash everyone in your path to get as much as you can out of this world, step on the little guy to get ahead, and then make sure your kids continue to step on the little guys. That's the ugly side of capitalism. I, I personally don't think unregulated capitalism is any better than stone-cold communism. To me, they're two extremes, and we're constantly trying to figure out how to live in the middle somewhere where you can be rewarded for your hard work, you can dream of making loads of money without relying on a, you know, a class of poor, struggling fellow citizens to do so. You, know, you, you don't need to exploit them to do so. People who, who uh, your, your ego won't let you understand may have worked just as hard as you have for what they're trying to get, but maybe they weren't born into the same opportunities. Maybe they didn't get the same lucky breaks. You know, that, 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 that's me. That's what I think. I, uh, that's an, and probably enough pontificated by me on that. Now, if, if you, now you know the gist of what communism is. Uh, so with communism, you can't get Bill Gates rich, but you also never have to worry about health insurance, the cost of higher education, saving for your retirement, uh, you know, et cetera. Uh, again, this is how it works in theory. In reality, it's, it's tended to lead to a lot of people living in extreme poverty, like when millions starved in the Ukrainian forced famine of 1921 and 1922. Well, uh, the theory of modern communism can pretty much be traced back to Karl Marx, a man who deserves, again, his own time suck for today. Just know that this German philosopher, political scientist, sociologist, journalist, and man of many other hats uh, created the blueprint that Soviet Union and other communist states would be founded on when he wrote the Communist Manifesto, along with fellow German social scientist Friedrich Engels, a book published in 1848. And in it, Marx stated that the history of all hetero existing society and the history of class struggles, something that he believed was happening between the uh, bourgeoisie, the select few upper class and upper middle class, who then controlled society, and the proletariat, uh, the working class masses who toiled to produce everything but who had no political control. He purported the idea that human society moved through a series of progressive stages from primitive communism 
Marx felt early hunter-gatherer societies were communist in nature because everyone had the same job uh, through to slavery, feudalism, and then to capitalism, and that in this in turn would be eventually replaced by communism. So for Marx, communism was seen as the inevitable kind of as well as desirable end for human society. And Marx, uh, while demonized by some modern capitalists, he wasn't, you know, a, a bad guy. He came from a good place with his theory. He was he was writing, you know, uh, his work in response to the Industrial Revolution that began in the mid-18th century in Europe with the rise of factories. And suddenly there was this ultra-wealthy factory owner class and then this ultra-poor, ultra-exploited child laborers and all uh, factory worker class. We'll now cut to 1905. Uh, to see the seeds of, uh, for the Cold War between U.S. capitalism and Soviet communism being planted, uh, a philosophical battle that may have cost Kennedy his life many years later. Uh, the seeds for communism in Russia were, were sown on, on, on Bloody Sunday, not the one Bono sung about with U2 in 1983, uh, the 1972 incident when 28 peaceful protesters were shot by British soldiers in Derry, Northern Ireland. Now, this is an even bloodier Sunday. Uh, man, uh, early 80s U2, baby. So good, right? That song, so good, Bloody Sunday. Uh, back when Bono was uh, more known for incredible lyrics and vocals than for wearing horrific sunglasses all the fucking time. It's like, he, it's like he saw some early Elton John videos and thought, that's a good start. I like what he's done with his eyewear, but there's so much more to be explored. So fucking annoying. Why do I hate his sunglasses so much? Um, January 22nd, 1905, large number of unarmed demonstrators led by Father Georgie Gapon were fired upon by soldiers of the Imperial Guard as they marched towards the Winter Palace to present a petition to Tsar Nicholas II of Russia asking for better working conditions. The total number killed in that day's clashes is un uncertain, but the Tsar's officials recorded 96 dead and 333 injured. Anti-government sources claim more than 4,000 dead. So a little, little discrepancy in the numbers. Uh, moderate estimates uh, still average around 1,000 killed or wounded, both from shots and from being trampled during the panic. Well, before Bloody Sunday, many peasants and working class people revered the Tsar and thought he was on their side. They blamed their troubles on the government, the rest of the government, the politicians, not necessarily the Tsar himself. However, after the shootings, uh, the Tsar was perceived to be an enemy of the working class and the desire for revolution began to spread. So this is, again, the seeds for communist revolution. We'll cut to World War I when the working class is still being exploited in the Russian Empire, millions living in abject poverty, and then millions of these already very poor people are forced by the Tsar to fight for Russia in World War I, uh, a war in which Russia suffered greater casualties than any other nation. Nearly 2 million soldiers were killed, nearly 5 million more are wounded. And based on which source you read, uh, anywhere from a few hundred thousand to 2 million Russian civilians also die. So needless to say, uh, the czar's approval ratings, uh, not sky high. They're, they're lower than Trump's uh, current approval ratings. Uh, a Marxist group known as the uh, Russian Socialist Democratic Labor Party is formed uh, in the country. It soon divides into two main factions, the Bolsheviks, who were led by Lenin, and the Mensheviks, who were led by Julius Martov. Now, it's a complicated, drawn-out revolution, but basically the Bolsheviks uh, overthrow the Tsar, and then shortly after, there is an extremely bloody civil war between the Bolsheviks and numerous other factions that last until 1922, uh, like, you know, like the Mensheviks and, uh, um, and eventually the Bolshe the Bolsheviks, you know, they, they win, uh, you know, after about 12 million more people die, uh, they change their name to the communist party in the process. Stalin eventually takes over after Lenin, uh, from Lenin after Lenin's death in 1924. And then big red really gets moving along and the communists make capitalists nervous, uh, especially under Stalin. Uh, millions starve and die under his rule. Some historians estimate his regime was responsible for the deaths of up to 60 million people, making him more of a killer than even Hitler. And he had a huge army. He had roughly 35 million troops at one point during World War II. And, uh, and that made Americans and most of the rest of the world, yeah, fucking nervous, especially when Stalin gave a speech in 1949 saying that capitalism and communism were incompatible. And then China becomes pro-Soviet communist nation in 1949. Now the capitalists get even more nervous. All right, that's a lot of people uh, living under an ideology, uh, you know, just diametrically opposed to your own. A lot more communist troops. And I get the nervousness, right? If suddenly hundreds of millions of people worldwide are converting to a system of government that's the opposite of your own, and they start trying to expand this government globally, which the Soviets did in Latin America, Asia, Eastern Europe, it would be silly just to, like, not worry about it. It's like, ah, that's like, I don't see the problem. Nah, it'll be fine. We'll be fine. We'll be fine. We're still a couple miles away. No, we're good. No, we're good. They're not going to do anything here. And, uh, and then Fidel Castro takes over Cuba, turns it into a Soviet-friendly communist nation in 1959. Well, the capitalists, they're, they're shitting their shorts now. 
right? Now, now these commies are only 110 miles away from the coast of Florida. The communists are knocking on the fucking door, uh, and the capitalists, uh, they start getting real, real, uh, nuke friendly. Now they start wanting to nuke some of these communists. Unfortunately, the communists also have nuclear weapons. Uh, the U S dropped atomic bombs on Hiroshima, Japan on August 6th, 1945 and on Nagasaki on August 9th. And president Truman, um, you know, was supposedly elated. He's very excited about this new weapon in the cold war. Uh, reports are that he, while he previously could only grow a five inch long erection on August 6th, 1945, uh, when the first bomb dropped, his erection grew to nearly eight inches long. Uh, that's why I found one of my sources and, and doubled in girth. And then on August 9th, when he dropped the second bomb, uh, on Nagasaki, uh, it grew to 14 inches long and he beat his wife to death with it. Sure. Other sources, all other sources will tell you that Bess Truman died on October 18, 1982 at the age of 97 in Independence, Missouri from congestive heart failure. But Bojangles assures me that she was beaten to death with Harry's rock hard nuclear cock. Uh, but seriously, uh, Truman was very excited about the A-bomb, right? We were the first nation to develop and detonate a nuclear bomb and it led directly to winning World War II. Uh, but then the Russians detonated a nuke on August 29th, 1949. And the capitalists were like, ah, Fuck. And now the nuclear arms race is in full swing. All right. And then there was the Truman Doctrine, which escalated, you know, the Cold War. Uh, the Truman Doctrine uh, arose from a speech delivered by President Truman before a joint session of Congress on March 12, 1947. And the immediate cause for the speech was a recent announcement by the British government that as of March 31st, it could no longer provide military and economic assistance to the Greek government in its civil war against the Greek Communist Party. So America wanted to help, right? Now we're going to actively uh, fight the war on communism abroad. This is the first uh, time we're doing this. this is the Truman Doctrine uh, established that the United States would provide mi political, military, and economic assistance to all democratic nations under threat from external or internal uh, uh, authoritarian forces. So you can just read into that. We're, n we're not going to put up with communist shit around the world. Right, the, the Truman Doctrine effectively reorientated U.S. foreign policy away from its usual stance previously of withdrawal from regional conflicts not directly involving the U.S. to one of possible intervention in faraway conflicts that didn't, you know, that weren't threatening us uh, in the immediate future. And that's a military policy that has remained to this day. Uh, it's a policy that led directly to the Korean War and to the Vietnam War. Right, both of those wars, uh, you know, were were fought in theory uh, to stop the advance of communism. And now the Cold War, the fight against the spread of communism is fucking on like Big Red Donkey Kong. And before Kennedy becomes president, the Cold War really revs up uh, another notch with the Warsaw Pact. Now, the Warsaw Pact was a treaty signed in Warsaw on May 14th by the Soviet Union, Albania, Poland, Romania, Hungary, East Germany, Czechoslovakia, Bulgaria. And uh, mostly it was an agreement for all 20th century Communist Party members to routinely uh, wear those big, silly uh, Russian uh, Ushanka fur caps with flaps over the ears. You know, the kind that 1% of college kids think is really hip and cool to wear to parties for like a year or so, and then they regret wearing it for the rest of their lives because it makes them look like a desperate-for-attention asshole. But seriously, uh, the treaty called on uh, the member states uh, to come to the defense of any member attacked by an outside force and set up a unified military command under Marshal Ivan S. Konev of the Soviet Union. It was signed in response to NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization signed on April 4th, 1949, signing up West Germany and allowing them to militarize on May 9th, 1955. All right, NATO already included original members Belgium, Canada, Denmark, France, Iceland, Italy, Luxembourg, the Netherlands, Norway, Portugal, the UK, and the United States. Greece and Turkey joined in 1952. Pro-democracy Western Europe and pro-communist Eastern Europe. Head to head, right? And now... There were uh, pro-American forces on one side of Berlin and communist Russian-backed forces on the other. And the friction between these two sides led to the creation of the Berlin Wall in 1961. All right, so now we're understanding how the, how the Cold War kind of forms. It gets moving and all these, you know, it's like a big game of fucking risk and people putting their, you know, pieces on the board and forming their alliances. And then also going back to 1947... When Truman changed U.S. foreign policy with the creation of uh, foreign military policy with the creation of the Truman Doctrine, he also established the CIA and gave them a crazy amount of power. Uh, the CIA was formed on September 18th, 1947, and its primary purpose was creating three-legged, one-eyed superhero Pitbull Bojangles, God damn it, to thwart the forces of evil wherever and whenever they occur. No. It was initially created primarily for gathering foreign military presence or uh, mil military intelligence, excuse me. But it could uh, do and soon did way more than just gather intelligence because there was the National Security Act of 1947. 
This was an act designed to counter Russians' totalitarian control over its military. It led to the formation of not only the CIA, but also the Joint Chiefs of Staff, the National Security Council, Council, several other government agencies. And then in 1948, the newly formed National Security Council approved top-secret directive NSC-10-2, which sanctioned U.S. intelligence to carry out a broad range of covert operations, including, quote, propaganda, economic warfare, demolition and evacuation measures, subversion against hostile states, including assistance to underground resistance movements, guerrillas, and refugee liberation groups. You hear what I'm saying? The CIA is now empowered to be a secret paramilitary organization able to autonomously fund and empower other paramilitary organizations around the world, and they could do so without approval from the president. In fact, in order to remain covert, the CIA was expected to not notify the Oval Office, you know, that it was engaged in covert operations that were often illegal in order to give the president and other high-ranking officials plausible deniability. And just like that, a fucking monster is born. Do you understand how scary the CIA really is? Now, now, and again, if you're a CIA, you know, employee listening, I'm sure there are many, many great people working in the CIA, but the agency itself, in theory, is fucking terrifying. Uh, it's a monster created in direct response to the fear of the spread of communism, a monster that's sanctioned by the U.S. government to basically do whatever the fuck it feels like it needs to do to keep us safe and do it secretly. When you think about it that way, it doesn't sound so crazy to think this monster could eventually kill our own president if it felt that our own president was endangering our nation by, say, I don't know, appearing to go soft on communism, the very ideology it was created to destroy. Now, again, in theory, the CIA is only allowed to do what it feels like it needs to do on foreign soil. But when you create an agency that gets to act secretly and illegally overseas, an agency trained to do illegal stuff and not get caught, I think common sense would tell you, it wouldn't be a big, you know, deal for that agency to, to cross a few more lines and do some shit domestically. I think it's crazy not to assume that. That's like if you train someone to be able to kill anyone at, at all with, without remorse. You don't get to be shocked when they come after you or someone you care about. You know, you, you've made this Frankenstein. So now let's, uh, let's talk about the Joint Chiefs of Staff really quick. The Joint Chiefs of Staff uh, is a body of senior uh, uniformed leaders in the United States Department of Defense who advise the president. Uh, the Secret Secretary of Defense, Homeland Security Council, and the National Security Council on Military Matters, and it formed organically and informally during World War II kind of out of necessity. And then it was officially formed by Truman in 1947, uh, shortly after he beat Bess uh, to death with his nuke boner, if you remember that. Uh, it didn't go away when World War II was over. It just shifted its attention to the Cold War, a dangerous new war that uh, its direct – yeah. Uh, a dangerous new war that is the direct predecessor to the war on terror and the war on drugs. It's, an, it's a war against an idea. And wars against ideas don't ever have to end. And now all the new weapons manufacturing infrastructure that we created as a nation to win World War II and the industry it involved from weapons manufacturers to big oil to the steel industry, big, big industries that make a lot of money off of war, well, this industry doesn't want to go away. You know, and now it has the CIA funding paramilitary groups around the world and selling them arms to carry out their military objectives around the world to keep it going. Has the Joint Chiefs of Staff fighting the Cold War directly in conflicts like the Korean War, keeping that industry chugging along. And right as Kennedy takes office, we're getting entrenched in Vietnam. The seeds of that conflict are being sown. Another long land siege is going to make the uh, arms companies, big oil, big steel, and other auxiliary businesses billions of dollars. War that will send billions more in tax money to the military itself. So we as a nation now have a huge monkey on our back. And that monkey uh, feeds by fucking shit up around the globe. Well, Dwight Eisenhower, Army General and 34th President of the United States, the president who followed Truman and directly preceded Kennedy, he warned us of the danger of this new machine going forward. Check out what he said. Uh, in his farewell farewell speech on January 17, 1961, days before Kennedy uh, was going to take office. This is his uh, introduction to the concept of, or for the rest of us, to the concept of the military-industrial complex. We have been compelled to create a permanent armaments industry of vast proportions. How to do this? Three and a half million men and women are directly engaged in the defense establishment. Now, this conjunction of an immense military establishment and a large arms industry is new in the American experience. The total influence, economic, political, even spiritual, is felt in every city, every state house, every office of the federal government. We recognize the imperative need for this development. 
yet we must not fail to comprehend its grave implications. Our toil, resources, and livelihood are all involved. So is the very structure of our society. In the councils of government, we must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The potential for the disastrous rise of misplaced power exists and will persist. We must never let the weight of this combination endanger our liberties or democratic processes. We should take nothing for granted. Only an alert and knowledgeable citizenry can compel the proper meshing of the huge industrial and military machinery of defense with our peaceful methods and goals, so that security and liberty may prosper together. All right, well, sorry about the uh, the audio cleanliness there. That was the best, uh, <laughs> the cleanest speech I could find of that old, or cleanest audio I could find of that old speech. But uh, that speech is often cited, again, when, when historians talk about the military-industrial complex. And after research I did for this time suck, I think JFK choosing to not only stand up to the military industrial complex, but actively trying to dismantle it is what got him killed. Uh, and let's find out why I think that with the time suck timeline of some key events leading up to that fateful day in Dallas. But before we do, let's check in with today's sponsor. Time suck is brought to you today by Dollar Shave Club. You may not lead the life that JFK had, powerful political family, movie star mistresses, war hero, president. But you can get a cleaner, smoother shave than old Jack Kennedy ever had by making the smarter choice and switching over to Dollar Shave Club. I switched, and I love it. I love their executive razor, manly, weighty handle, six stainless steel blades per cartridge. And you get four cartridges uh, sent to your home every month, and you get a tube of that Dr. Carver shave butter. Uh, I never cared for shaving cream, but I love the shave butter. Uh, Feels good on my face. Feels good on my armpits. Yeah, I shave my pits. And full disclosure, uh, feels great on my balls. Hell yes, I shave my balls. And I never worry for a second about those six steel blades uh, mangling up anything important down there. There's no razor irritation, no ingrown hairs, not with Dr. Carver's shave butter, or as I like to sometimes call it, Dr. Gentle Touches Ball Butter. So get a great shave at a great price. Conveniently delivered right to your door. Uh, Don't go to the store. Don't spend a fortune on gimmicky shaving tech you don't need. And give Dollar Shave Club a try. For a limited time, time suckers get their first month of the executive razor with a tube of their Dr. Carver shave butter for only five bucks with free shipping. After that, razors are just a few bucks a month. That's a $15 value for only $5. In your first month's box, you get an awesome weighty handle, full cassette, four cartridges, and a tube of that Dr. Carver shave butter. And after your first month, replacement cartridges ship automatically at the regular price. No hidden fees, no commitments, cancel anytime you like. You can get this offer exclusively at dollarshaveclub.com slash timesuck. That's dollarshaveclub.com slash timesuck. And now, uh, let's take a look at the events that led up to JFK's assassination in Dallas with the Time Suck timeline. Strap on those boots, soldier. We're marching down a Time Suck timeline. January 20, 1961, Kennedy takes office and introduces a shift in Cold War policy with his inaugural address, stating that both sides, Russia and the U.S., begin anew the quest for peace before the dark powers of destruction unleashed by science engulf all humanity and planned or accidental self-destruction. March 23, 1961, Kennedy changes policy on Laos by ending U.S. support of anti-communist ruler uh, General Fumi uh, Nosovan, whose government was backed and installed by CIA-slash-Pentagon forces under Eisenhower. Barely in office two months, Kennedy has already pitted himself directly against the military-industrial complex. By 1963, Kennedy's relationship with the CIA would deteriorate to the point, become so contentious that he would uh, say, quote, I wanted to sp- I, I want to splint splinter the CIA in a thousand pieces and scatter it to the winds. So not not a big fan. April 15th through 19th, 1961, barely three months into office, Kennedy has to deal with the Cuban Bay of Pigs crisis. On, a t- on April 17, a Cuban brigade of exiles trained and commanded by the CIA invade Cuba through the Bay of Pigs in an attempt to assassinate leader Fidel Castro and then overthrow his communist government. Remember, this is why they formed to do things exactly like this topple governments they perceive as a threat to democracy. Uh, They fail, and they're captured by Castro's army. Kennedy feels like the CIA has trapped him into trying to send over a full-scale invasion of troops into Cuba to save the brigade of over a 1,000 soldiers. The CIA, the Joint Chiefs of Staff, push him, obviously, very much uh, to do exactly that, but he refuses. He won't take the bait. 
Uh, the CIA never forgives him for this. You know, they, they abandon his, their mission, or he, he abandons their mission. Uh, he's concerned about Russian retaliation against an invasion of their Cuban ally. He thinks the retaliation uh, could escalate into a full-scale nuclear war. Uh, he feels tricked by the CIA, CIA, and two months later passes National Security Action Memoranda, uh, two of them, uh, NSAMs 55 and 57, which take military-type operations out of the hands of the CIA. So he's already trying to, like, reduce the scope of their power. And again, they're not going to like that. Well, then on October 27, 1961, Checkpoint Charlie standoff. Six months after the Bay of Pigs, uh, the Soviets and the U.S. have a standoff in Berlin, the Checkpoint Charlie crisis, a situation uh, that brought us super close to nuclear war. Uh, on October 27th, 10 American M48 tanks approached Checkpoint Charlie and opening the New Berlin Wall where people would travel from east to west, you know, Berlin and vice versa. Uh, they were confronted by 10 Soviet tanks. 20 more Soviet tanks arrived as reinforcements and then 20 more Allied tanks reinforced the first U.S. Uh, 10 tanks. So the conflict uh, began uh, on October 22nd over a dispute as to whether East German guards were authorized to examine the travel documents of a U.S. diplomat named Alan Leitner passing through to East Berlin to see the opera. One more reason for me not to be into the opera. It nearly got us into a nuclear war. Uh, now on October 27th, 60 tanks are engaged in this face-off. Right, 30 on each side, 100 yards apart, guns trained on one another, and they would keep their weapons pointed at each other for 16 straight hours through the night. Can you imagine being one of the soldiers in one of those tanks, 16 fucking straight hours of a cannon being pointed right at you? Do you ever slip out to go to the bathroom during those tents, 16 hours, or do you just not have to go to the bathroom because you are continually pissing and shitting yourself? Well, the instigator of the confrontation, U.S. Army General Lucius Clay, was ordered by Kennedy to withdraw. After Kennedy was able to speak to Soviet Premier Nikita Khrushchev, uh, the Soviet leader who followed Stalin, the Joint Chiefs of Staff felt that speaking with Khrushchev uh, the way Kennedy did was like treason. General Clay wanted to uh, wanted JFK to follow a tank assault at the wall with an all-out nuclear strike on East Berlin. He wanted to win the Cold War by striking first. In a telegram to Secretary of State Dean Rusk, he said, Today, we have the nuclear strength to assure victory at an awful cost. He urged that a ground attack on the Russians be followed with a, quote, nuclear strike. This is a short-sighted Cold War military mentality uh, that Kennedy had to deal with. Dudes who wanted to fucking nuke Russia. As, as if they weren't going to nuke us back. As if tens of millions of people and possibly many, many, many more that weren't, uh, weren't going to be obliterated in some kind of nuclear holocaust. Like, what the fuck were they thinking? Just, uh, look, if we nuke everyone else in the world, Mr. President, uh, there will be no one alive uh, to hurt us anymore, okay? Well, well then, who, uh, who will we fight, General Clay? Uh, what, what, what use will we have for you anymore? Mm, that's, a, that's, a, that's a good point, Mr. President. Uh, okay, uh, let's nuke everyone else first. And then to keep uh, war moving along, let's begin nuking ourselves. We, we will continue to fight until no one's left. And then uh, we will bring war to heaven itself. Uh, and, <clears throat> and then there's uh, the Cuban Missile Crisis, the crisis that 2000 uh, Kevin Cosner film, 13 Days, is based on. That's October 16 through 28, 1962. Uh, a little over a year later, Kennedy has to deal with Cuba again in a major way. The Cuban Missile Crisis may be the most dangerous moment in human history so far. Uh, in those 13 days, again, October 16 to 28, uh, 1962, Kennedy demanded that Soviet Premier Nikita Khrushchev, or Khrushchev uh, dismantle and withdraw Russian nuclear-armed missiles from Cuba. They were building over there. Kennedy also set up a naval blockade to prevent Russian uh, ships from delivering more arms to the island. And, and if you're thinking it was crazy of the Soviets to try this, just know that we already had nuclear weapons in Turkey pointed at them. So as aggressive as it might at first seem to start building nukes in Cuba, it, it was really more of a tit for tat. Russia wanted to defend Castro from further attempts on his life from U.S. forces and also to create a balance of power due to America actively surrounding Russia with military bases and then nuclear weapons in Turkey. Uh, as the construction of nuclear missiles in Cuba accelerated during these 13 days, the Joint Chiefs of Staff practically got down on their hands and knees and just begged JFK to nuke them. They just wanted to fucking nuke the shit out of Cuba and then also nuke Russia. Uh, one of the Joint Chiefs even told JFK that backing down from Russia in any way would be comparable to when Britain caved to Hitler in a crisis in 1938 at a conference in Munich when, trying to avoid war with Germany, uh, Britain compelled Czechoslovakia to concede territory to the Nazis. So they're just like fucking goading him into trying to nuke these guys. But Kennedy, again, he doesn't take the bait. Uh, barely a year removed from the Checkpoint Charlie situation, America was again on the brink of creating a nuclear holocaust for the rest of the world. Well, instead of war, Kennedy chose to open back-channel dialogue uh, with Khrushchev, uh, one he kept the CIA and Joint Chiefs in the dark about. 
And Khrushchev eventually ordered Soviet ships to stop dead in the water rather than challenge the U.S. quarantine. And then on October 27th, after much deliberation between the Soviet Union and Kennedy's cabinet, Kennedy secretly agreed to remove all missiles set in southern Italy and in Turkey, the latter on the border of the Soviet Union, uh, in exchange for Khrushchev removing all missiles in Cuba. And then at 9 a.m. Eastern Standard Time on October 28, a new message from Khrushchev was broadcast on Radio Moscow. Uh, Khrushchev stated that, the Soviet government, in addition to previously issued instructions on the uh, cessation of further work at the building sites for the weapons, has issued a new order on the dismantling of the weapons, which you describe as offensive, and their crating and return to the Soviet Union. Uh, so they're shipping them back. So the last U.S. Mus uh, missiles were dismantled by April 24th, 1963, were flown into Turkey soon after that. And then Truman uh, heard about all of this from his retirement in Independence, Missouri, and his dick shriveled back inside of his body, where it would remain tiny, uh, limp, and useless for the rest of his days. And Khrushchev trusted Kennedy uh, would hold his end of the bargain. The two had been corresponding via letters, uh, letters declassified uh, years ago, that showed a willingness and a desire on both sides to figure out how capitalists and communists could coexist, could work hand in hand. Khrushchev was not the capitalist-hating uh, leader that Stalin was, and Kennedy was not the commie hating leader that Truman was. You know, so good stuff, right? Well, definitely good for the human race. Uh, definitely bad for JFK's continually worsening relationship with the CIA and the Joint Chiefs. Uh, he wasn't getting along well with the military side of the military industrial complex. He planned on da drastically reducing the CIA's budget in the coming years, effectively cutting their balls off. He fired, you know, the director of the CIA at one point and numerous other high-ranking CIA officials. And we'll soon find out he wanted to reduce our foreign military involvement by abandoning the idea of war with Vietnam, which would have cost, again, the military and others uh, billions and billions of dollars. And he wasn't dealing uh, well with the industrial side of the complex either. Uh, April 6, 1962, let's bounce back to the spring of 1962 for a second. On April 6, uh, Kennedy brokered a contract between big steel companies and the labor unions that worked for them. JFK believed that when steel prices went up, they quickly drove up the price of everything else in the economy, and he got union steel workers to accept a modest settlement from the United Steel Company with the understanding that then the company would help keep inflation low by not raising steel prices. Well, then on April 10th, 1962, uh, Roger Blau, chairman of U.S. Steel, met with Kennedy and handed him a copy of a press release that we're going to uh, uh, send out announcing that effective at 12.01 a.m. tomorrow, U.S. Steel will raise the price of the company's steel products by an average of about 3.5%. Those backstabbing motherfuckers. You know, just... Uh, we appreciate your union negotiation uh, very much, Mr. President. We're, we're raising the price of steel 3.5%, uh, and now, uh, because of your work and the sacrifice of, of those workers, it's going to be pure profit. It's, uh, it's fantastic. M my mistress has been waiting for her own yacht for forever, for many months. Uh, she hates it. She hates it when we fuck on my wife's yacht. So... Uh, now I'll be able to give her her very own yacht that she deserves and, and still have enough money left over to ship several more families over from another third world country to, to literally dance, uh, in my mansion for my amusement as, as I drunkenly shoot around their feet and drink some baby's blood from a giant goblet made out of African diamonds. Yeah, uh, JFK, he knew uh, that uh, the union workers and himself had been double-crossed, obviously, by big business, and he's enraged. He tells advisors, my father always told me that all businessmen were sons of bitches, but I never believed him until now. Uh, that remark appeared in the New York Times on April 23rd, 1962, and the corporate world never forgot it. And, and again, uh, to die-hard capitalist war hawks, he appeared to be a communist sympathizer, man. Anti-war, anti-big business, you know, anti-big business, you know, willing to negotiate with communists. What do you, what do you fucking hate, America? Uh, defense contracts uh, were critical to Big Steel, and the Defense Department and steel companies uh, were, were very closely connected. Defense Secretary McNamara told him that the increase in price would cost the government a billion more dollars. Attorney General Bobby Kennedy uh, convened a federal grand jury to look into price fixing by various large steel companies. He looked into possible violations of antitrust laws. You know, JFK and Bobby weren't afraid to stand up to big business. Both of them were later assassinated. Coincidence? I don't think so. Uh, check out what JFK said about big steel companies at a press conference on April 11th, 1962. He says, United States Steel and other leading steel corporations increasing steel prices by some $6 a ton constitute a wholly unjustifiable and irresponsible defiance of the public interest. The American people will find it hard, as I do, to accept a situation in which a tiny handful of steel executives whose pursuit of private power and profit exceeds their sense of public responsibility, can show such utter contempt for the interests 
of 185 million Americans. Wow, man. Power to the fucking people. He just called their corporate leader, uh, called him out, called, called out the public leaders, publicly shamed them for fucking over the American working class. That is awesome. That's exactly how you also put a target on your back. Again, in general, the more I read about this guy, the more I like him. And yes, I know, and some of you have already written in from episode one, I know he was a big womanizer, but that's not all he was. He was also a man for the people, a courageous motherfucker who stood up for what he believed in the face of adversity as a politician, you know? And, I, and in that sense, I kind of get why Jack Yale put up with a lot of his shit, you know? Still, again, not get what he did, but it wasn't like she was being cheated on by some deadbeat barfly, you know? He was one of the bravest leaders the United States has ever known. Uh, and again, and again, again, <laughs> doesn't make it cheating right. But it uh, also doesn't, you know, diminish his value as, as a human being. Uh, well, just a few days after that speech, all the big steel companies uh, reversed their decision to raise the price of steel. JFK's speech had done the trick. Well, his speech, and along with the promise uh, behind closed doors to start handing out defense contracts to foreign steel companies if the U.S. ones weren't going to fucking play ball. Uh, but again, you know, that's not going to leave him any new fans and big business. An article in the 19, or April 30th, 1962 issue of U.S. News and World Report suggested that the president's heavy hand with big business made him appear to act like a Soviet commissar. Uh, Bobby Kennedy was especially disliked. He continued his antitrust investigation, and eventually U.S. Steel and other big corporations were forced to pay maximum, maximum fines in 1965 for price-fixing uh, activities between 1955 and 1961. The Kennedy brothers weren't playing the game. They weren't allowing big business to do what they wished, and that was not status quo in D.C. It hasn't been status quo since. Big business doesn't like that. Well, author James Douglas of JFK and the Unspeakable, Why He Died and Why It Matters, a book I relied on a ton for this episode, uh, believes while he has no proof of who it was that some big business insider is the one who pushed the CIA, perhaps through huge bribes to kill Kennedy. Uh, the CIA has units whose sole purpose was to carry out covert, covert assassinations. Part of the planning of their missions was creating credible stories to blame other people and other governments for their killings. Was Oswald one of their stories? If anyone could pull this off, it would be them. We'll never know because the CIA agents are able to lie legally under oath due to the classified nature of their missions. Well, Douglas presents a ton of court documents to prove, though, that in later years, agents would say, in so many words, that Oswald was at least a CIA asset, if not an outright agent, because of the nature of files on Oswald in possession of the CIA. Uh, one former agent, Jim Wilcott, who worked in the finance department of the Tokyo CIA station from 1960 to 1964 as an accountant, said in a 1978 interview with the San Francisco Chronicle that it was common knowledge in the Tokyo CIA station that Oswald worked for the agency. He'd heard numerous agents talk about it after having a little too much to drink. And, uh, and you have all heard uh, various assertions that Oswald was a CIA, CIA operative in the first episode of this two-parter. Uh, more on that in a bit. More on that for sure. A lot more. First, let's talk about nukes and Vietnam. Uh, May 6, 1963, at Camp Smith in Hawaii, JFK holds a conference with military advisors about what to do with Vietnam. Uh, specifically, he wants to withdraw. Uh, the, the Joint Chiefs, you know, not surprisingly, don't. Uh, the CIA doesn't. JFK doesn't care what they want and orders that plans be drawn up for a complete withdrawal by the end of 1963. He also issues National Security Action Memorandum 239, ordering his principal security advisors to pursue both a nuclear test ban treaty and a policy of general and complete disarmament. Do you hear what I'm saying? He wants to end our nuclear weapons program. It must have taken everything those generals had to keep from jumping over the fucking desk and killing him right there or just punch him in the dick or something. I mean, those generals' nuke boners must have gone so limp at the thought of JFK taking away their new favorite toy. They wanted to nuke everybody. I came across declassified reports of generals advising Kennedy to nuke the commies in Vietnam, nuke them in North Korea, nuke China, nuke East Germany, nuke Cuba, nuke Russia. They wanted to fucking nuke the world. And uh, as crazy as that sounds. And now uh, he's taken away one of their, you know, one of their, their big dreams. You know, and, and, and also how much would have not continued with Vietnam cost the military industrial complex? Well, the Pentagon estimates uh, that military expenditures for the Vietnam War between 65 and 74 uh, amounted to uh, just under one hundred thirty nine uh, billion dollars. Uh, the department notes that a large portion of that sum would have been spent, you know, in any event, uh, the department prepared another total called war costs only that came to one hundred and eleven billion. And, uh, and that was, you know, representing expenditures that would have not otherwise been made if we hadn't gone into Vietnam. Well, the war cost 10 times more than support for all levels of education and 50 times more than was spent for housing and community development during the same period. The U.S. spent more money on Vietnam in 10 years than it spent during the nation's entire history for public higher education or for police protection. And that's from uh, 
uh, well, I was going to say Library of Congress. It's it's uh, library.cqpress.com and a fucking bunch of other stuff. <laughs> uh, and who made the most money off the Vietnam War? Well, arms dealers made a lot. To get an idea of how much these companies make in general, the 100 largest arms producers and military services contractors recorded $395 billion in arms sales in 2012 alone. That's from a Time article. My God. General Dynamics, uh, their arms sales in 2012, alone, uh, almost $21 billion. Total sales in 2012, uh, $31.5 billion. 2012 profit, $332 million. They employed 92,000 people, just over 92,000. That's a Virginia-based company. Uh, they specialize in aircraft, land, uh, expeditionary combat vehicles, shipbuilding. And they actually lost $332 million in 2012. You know, when they went, they went down to only $20.9 billion in arms sales. Down from twenty three point three billion the year before. This is a public traded company that employs again roughly like a hundred thousand people. One of over a hundred large companies linked to the military. War. I'm just trying to make this point is very fucking big business. A long protracted war means lots of business, lots of jobs. The spilling of foreign blood equates directly to corporate profits, and that's not some leftist kind of you know fucking anti American thought. That's just the fucking truth. It just it is what it is. You don't you don't build a big machine that needs continual bloodshed to keep hundreds of thousands, if not millions, employed, and then just shut it down, not without a fight. You know, God knows how many com- uh, how many companies like this, uh, uh, how much they made in Vietnam compared to how much they would have made without it. That's just a lot of money was floating around. And Kennedy didn't care about these big businesses making war profits. He didn't care about what the Warhawks thought. Warhawks thought I mean, he'd experienced the loss of war firsthand. He'd watched his men in his unit die in that you know boat sinking in World War II. He'd saved other men's lives. He felt the pain of a bad back, you know, uh, getting worse by the year. Uh, a back that he was made worse by war. Like he he literally felt the pain of war every day. And he was smart enough also to know that a victory in Vietnam was unattainable. Ten years before he became president, JFK knew that Vietnam victory was impossible. An official at the U.S. consulate in Saigon, who had written speeches for Kennedy, uh, was a very young congressman in 1951, had told Kennedy when he visited Vietnam that war in Vietnam was pointless. The public back home wouldn't support a protracted land siege, just like the support for French troops uh, in the, dwindled from the French public in the first Indochina War. Because, uh, you know, the French, before, previous to the U.S. involvement in Vietnam, it was a, a, a French colony, Vietnam was. And then they fought a long fucking war with the Viet Cong, and eventually they just lost a bunch of lives and public support waned, and they went out just like we ended up doing, you know, years later. Uh, you know, and the, and the U.S. Uh, would be there from, what, 1955 until 1975. Until finally, with the fall of Saigon on April 30th, 1975, when the Viet Cong won the war, and then all of uh, Vietnam was unified to the communist nation. The poor people of South Vietnam, man, they wanted a democratic government. Those, those poor bastards, 30 years of continual battle, only to end up a communist in the end anyway. And Kennedy, he fucking, that's what he thought was going to happen anyway. He's like, why lose all these lives when it's probably just going to end up being a communist nation anyway? Well, uh, we, we didn't get to follow his vision, unfortunately. After he was assassinated, you know, as we know now, U.S. involvement uh, instead of being de-escalated was escalated dramatically over there. Uh, and then there's also uh, his commencement speech at American University. A lot of people point to this, putting a target on his head. Uh, June 10th, 1963, Kennedy gives a speech at American University. Uh, had tons of interesting anti-Cold War, anti-military industrial complex thoughts. Referring to the Soviets, he said, our basic common link is that we all inhabit this small planet. We all breathe the same air. We all cherish our children's future, and we are all mortal. Regarding the Cold War itself, he says, let us reexamine our attitude towards the Cold War Remembering that we are not in a debate seeking to pull up debating points or pile up debating points. Regarding the new possibility of nuclear war in the world, he says, above all, while defending our own vital interests, nuclear powers must avert those confrontations which bring an adversary to a choice of either a humiliating retreat or nuclear war. To adopt that kind of course in the nuclear age would be evidence only of the bankruptcy of our policy or a collective death wish for the world. Well, both Castro and Khrushchev uh, liked Kennedy's American University speech. The night following Kennedy's speech at American University, Alabama Governor Wallace decided to back down on his anti-civil rights stance and let two black students register for classes at the University of Alabama. Kennedy described the plight of African Americans that night in a televised address, saying, uh, quote, The Negro baby born in America today, regardless of the section of the nation in which he is born, has about one half as much chance of completing a high school as a white baby born in the same place in the same day. One third as much chance of completing college. One third as much chance of becoming a professional man. Twice as much chance of becoming unemployed. About one seventh 
as much chance of earning 10000 a year, a life expectancy which is seven years shorter, and the prospects of earning only half as much. So see, like just in general, Kennedy is throwing very, co- very radical ideas out for this point in history. You know, he decides to become a champion for peace and for, for race equality in an area uh, when much of the country was very much in favor of war and prejudice. Going against the grain set forth by the powers that be is a great way to get killed. People fear change. Well, Russia, Russia was moved by these speeches. They had jammed transmissions of speeches by the West previously for 15 years, but they let Kennedy's American University speech be listened to and published the transcript. Peace was in the air, and that meant a staggering loss of income from the manufacturers of war. And the dude was a hell of a speaker, uh, by the way. Uh, listen to this excerpt uh, of a speech he gave on July 26, 1963, Regarding, uh, regarding, <laughs> regarding his nuclear test ban treaty. Good evening, my fellow citizens. I speak to you tonight in a spirit of hope. Eighteen years ago, the event of nuclear weapons changed the course of the world, as well as the war. Since that time, all mankind has been struggling to escape from the darkening prospect of mass destruction on Earth. In an age when both sides have come to possess enough nuclear power to destroy the human race several times over, the world of communism and the world of free choice have been caught up in a vicious circle of conflicting ideology and interest. Each increase of tension has produced an increase of arms. Each increase of arms has produced an increase of tension. In these years, the United States and the Soviet Union have frequently communicated suspicion and warnings to each other, but very rarely hope. Our representatives have met at the summit and at the brink. They have met in Washington and in Moscow, in Geneva, and at the United Nations. But too often, these meetings have produced only darkness, discord, or disillusion. Yesterday, a shaft of light cut into the darkness. Negotiations were concluded in Moscow on a treaty to ban all nuclear tests in the atmosphere, in outer space, and underwater. For the first time, an agreement has been reached on bringing the forces of nuclear destruction under international control. Man, check that out. He's just gonna—he's just gonna end, you know, the the the, the nuke buildup. I, I think there's a real chance it was this kind of talk that got Kennedy killed. He's publicly trying to turn the country away from war, away from the military-industrial complex. But what about Lee Harvey Oswald? If the military-industrial complex, including the CIA, wanted him dead so bad, what does he have to do with that? Well, uh, I have some thoughts on that. Let's let's hop out of this timeline and take a look at him. Good job, soldier. You've made it back. Barely. All right, let's take a little little look-see into Lee Harvey Oswald. Uh, Lee Harvey Oswald was born on October 18, 1939 in New Orleans, New Orleans, Louisiana, to Marguerite and Robert Oswald Sr., who died of a heart attack two months prior to Lee's birth. Uh, following her husband's death, Marguerite Oswald sent Lee and his two older brothers to live in an orphanage. Uh, when little Lee asked why he couldn't live with his mom anymore, uh, right before they had to go live in the orphanage, she looked him uh, in his tear-stained eyes, and she said, This is the Kennedy family's fault. Everything bad that happened in the world is the Kennedy family's fault. You never forget that. And then she shook him until his brain didn't work right anymore, and he believed her. No, of course not. Uh, remarried for a few years, Marguerite eventually moved with her children to the Bronx, New York. Uh, while his mother was working long shifts, the young Oswald was often left to fend for himself, spending time at the library while developing a habit of playing hooky from his eighth-grade classes. He was eventually picked up and placed in a detention hall where a social worker described him as emotionally detached, giving off the feeling of a kid nobody gave a darn about. Well, Marguerite and Oswald uh, eventually moved back to New Orleans, uh, where Oswald continued to develop an interest in socialist literature, where he began, he began to read in New, in New York. In 1956, he joined the U.S. Marines. Uh, he was a better-than-average marksman. Uh, he was also court-martialed after accidentally shooting himself in the elbow with an unauthorized 22 handgun, so he couldn't have been... Uh, that well, that good with guns. <laughs> he was court-martialed again for fighting with a sergeant who thought he was responsible, um, who he thought was responsible for his punishment in the matter of shooting himself. Well, Oswald ended his military service the following year and arranged a trip to Moscow, uh, where he informed Russian authorities that he wanted to move to the Soviet Union. 
After some de- uh, debate by the government uh, over Oswald's possible role as a spy, he was allowed to stay in the city of Minsk, where he was monitored closely by the KGB. And it was there that he met uh, Marina Prus- uh, Marina uh, Prusikova in April 1961, uh, but then dissatisfied with the quality of life in the Soviet Union, Oswald returned to the U.S. in 1962, bringing his, uh, his, his new wife and their newborn daughter with him. The family sets up residence in Dallas, Texas, with Oswald taking uh, on the post office alias of Alec J. Hiddell. Uh, around this time, Oswald's interest in communism transformed into support for Cuba. In early 1963, he ordered a 38 handgun via the mail, later acquired a rifle. Uh, he told Marina to take a picture of him with his weapons, a document that would later be used as criminal evidence, as Oswald's rifle was eventually identified as the firearm used to murder President John F. Kennedy. Uh, in April 1963, Oswald allegedly tried to shoot right-wing ex-general uh, Edwin A. Walker through the window of his home, but missed. After returning to New Orleans by himself for a short stint in September 1963, Oswald took a trip to Mexico City where he attempted to obtain passage to Cuba and the Soviet Union to no avail. Oswald then returned to the States, where he got a job working at the Texas School Book Depository in Dallas. His family stayed with a friend uh, in a nearby suburb, and Marina gave birth to a second daughter that October. On the afternoon of November 22, 1963, around the time of President John F. Kennedy's approaching motorcade through Dallas, Oswald killed the president and wounded Texas Governor John P. Connolly when he fired three shots from the sixth-floor window of a book depository. And then, of course, you know, President Kennedy died at Parkland Memorial Hospital shortly after the attack at the age of 46. Well, these are the basic biography.com facts. Does make him look like a communist sympathizer, doesn't it? And, and that's the Warren Commission's take. Oswald was a misguided commie who wanted to strike at the heart of American uh, of America and freedom and kill our president. But, but check this shit out. Former CIA agent Victor Marchetti wrote a book called The CIA and the Cult of Intelligence. He claims that in 1959... The year of Oswald's defection, the U.S. was having a hard time acquiring intelligence on the Soviets and were trying all kinds of crazy shit. He claimed that ONI, the Office of Naval Intelligence, had recruited and trained roughly 20 men to act as if they had become delusioned by the U.S. government, to act as if they were very interested in communism. They were made to appear to be disenchanted, poor American youths who had become turned off and wanted to see what communism was all about. And the CIA hoped the Soviets would recruit them to be spies. Right, then they could be double agents. Well, could Oswald have been one of these men? The Warren Report re- uh, portrayed Oswald as disillusioned and mentally ill. However, former Marines who knew Oswald said he was staunchly anti-communist, staunchly anti-Russia. One former roommate who went on to become a California judge, James Bethello, believes that Oswald's quote-unquote defection to Russia was absolutely a cover. He believes, as do many others, that Oswald was absolutely working for the CIA at that time. Uh, His former Marine roommate believes this, a roommate who went on to become a judge. Why would he say that if it wasn't true? This is a guy who built a career on following the law and being beholden to the truth. I think it gives his take a little more credence than if it was said by some dude who just like sold crystals to protect evil spirits from invading your dreams at the Venice Beach Boardwalk. Wouldn't be as powerful if it was coming from, you know, that dude. Just, you need amethyst, man. You need amethyst, man. There's no no way uh, quartz is going to protect you from a level three demon, man. Oh, and um, uh, by the way, another thing. Oswald didn't do it, man. He totally didn't do it. You know, he couldn't have done it, man. No, the moon wasn't aligned with his sign that day, man. He, he wasn't carrying topaz, you know? <laughs> How can he do it? Yeah. No, this is a fucking judge. It's not that dude. So, uh, again, you know, if, if it doesn't make you believe that maybe there's some shady shit on I think it gives you pause, makes you wonder, like, well, why the fuck would he say that? And, and, and many believe the Warren Report left out extensive connections between Oswald and other people connected with the CIA, such as uh, George uh, de Morenshield, a guy who received a large Haitian contract after doing a favor for the CIA relating to Oswald in Dallas, a dude who died suddenly when he decided to talk about the CIA connection between himself and Oswald years later, uh, three hours after revealing a CIA-sanctioned contact with Oswald on March 29, 1977, that's when he was gonna. Uh, that's when he revealed it. George died of an allegedly self-inflicted gunshot wound, putting a shotgun to his mouth and pulling the trigger. That's a weird coincidence. You know, three hours after you reveal some uh, CIA information that others would be very interested in, that might actually make it look like Oswald wasn't responsible, or at least was acting on behalf of the CIA, and then you fucking off yourself. That's weird. Uh, in April 1963, Oswald moved to New Orleans and found work at the Riley Coffee Company, a company owned by William B. Riley, a wealthy supporter of the CIA-sponsored Cuban Revolutionary Council. That's a, there's a connection. In early uh, September 1963, Oswald uh, was uh, witnessed meeting CIA agent David Atlee Phillips in the busy lobby of a downtown Dallas office building. 
by Alpha 66 leader Antonio uh, Vesiana. Uh, told, he told this to the House Committee investigation to Kennedy's assassination years later and, uh, and then was shot in the head shortly after testifying. That's fucking weird, right? Uh, he survived uh, and later said the FBI warned him three times there would be an assassination attempt on his life. And then after he was shot, the FBI did investigate the assassination attempt. Also uh, pretty strange. And there's tons of other people quoted in various books and articles who swear up and down that Oswald was, in fact, a CIA agent. Uh, the theory is that he was a CIA agent tricked into taking a fall. He was a patsy uh, for the assassination, and then he was killed by another CIA associate, Jack Ruby, a mafia guy that the CIA had used in the past. And again, I know there's a lot of weird, crazy stuff. Maybe this stuff, you're like, wait, what do you say? What is it? How does that make sense? I know, it, it gets a little crazy. But, you know, the more you read, the more just weird coincidences just keep stacking up. Uh, and again, I just keep going back to the notion that Kennedy could have ended the Cold War uh, as being like motive for these for these things to, to, to happen, for, for the CIA to, to want him dead. In 2001, Nikita Khrushchev, uh, his, his son, uh, Nikita Khrushchev's son, excuse me, Sergei, uh, wrote in the New York Times, I am convinced that if history had allowed them another six years, they would have brought the Cold War to a close before the end of the 1960s. But in 1963, President Kennedy was killed, and a year later, in October 1964, my father was removed from power. And, and, and again, ending the Cold War would have cost the yeah, military-industrial complex so much money. Military expenditures by the U.S. during the Cold War uh, years were estimated to have been $8 trillion. You don't fuck with $8 trillion and not risk being killed by some very wealthy people who have a lot to gain with that kind of money. So, I don't know. Maybe Lee Harvey Oswald was a CIA operative. Maybe he was a pawn. Maybe he's a scapegoat. Maybe the CIA or some members of big business or someone tied to the Pentagon really did conspire to have him killed for fucking up the Cold War. Maybe he was going to dismantle the CIA. He disregarded the advice of the Joint Chiefs. He wanted to talk to Russia instead of nuke them. There's evidence that he wanted to talk to Castro and reestablish relations with Cuba. None of that was status quo for the other powerful people around him. And as well-connected as Kennedy was, maybe if he just keeps stirring up some of the biggest hornet's nests in the fucking world over and over and over, maybe you end up dead. You end up with a bullet uh, in your head, you know? Maybe it's a bullet in the back of your head, maybe it's a bullet in the front of your head. Maybe it's two bullets, one from the front, one from the back. Before we take a minute to reflect on this mammoth time suck and everything I've been talking about, this suck on a topic you'd literally do a year's worth of episodes about, start a whole podcast on just this subject... Let's look uh, closely one more time at the day Kennedy died in Dallas. So why was Kennedy in Dallas that day um, on November 22nd, 1963? Well, uh, by the fall of 1963, JFK and his political advisors were preparing for the next presidential campaign. He wanted to be reelected. And although he had not formally announced his candidacy, it was clear that, you know, President Kennedy was going to run. And he seemed confident about his chances for reelection. At the end of September, the president traveled west, speaking in nine different states in less than a week. The trip was meant to put a spotlight on natural resources and conservation efforts, but JFK also used it to sound out these themes as uh, education, national security, uh, world peace he wanted to run on in 1964. Um, a month later, the president addressed Democratic gatherings in Boston and Philadelphia. Then on November 12th, uh, he held the first important political planning session for the upcoming election year. At the meeting, JFK stressed the importance of winning Florida and Texas. Talk about his plans to visit both states in the next two weeks. Uh, Mrs. Kennedy would accompany him on the swing through Texas, which would be her first extended public appearance since the loss of their baby Patrick on, in August. Now, on November 21st, the president and the first lady departed on Air Force One for the two-day five-city tour of Texas. President Kennedy was aware that a feud among party leaders in Texas could jeopardize his chances of carrying the state in 1964, and one of his aims for the trip was to bring Texas Democrats together. He also knew that a relatively small but vocal group of extremists was contributing to political tensions in Texas and would likely make its presence felt, particularly in Dallas, where U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations, Adlai Stevenson, had been physically attacked a month earlier after making a speech there. Yeah, that was, that was, that's a crazy story. National Indi uh, Indignation Convention founder Frank McGahey had interrupted Adlai's speech and was asking why Stevenson insisted on negotiating with communist dictators. By the way, this National Indignation Convention was a grassroots conservative movement in the 1960s to protest the Kennedy administration and its attempts to bring socialism and tyranny to the United States. That's how fucking worried about JFK just people were. They were so worried about him being a commie. Uh, kind of reminds me of people being worried about Obama's, you know, alleged ties to radical Islam, which just like, you know, JFK's concerns were completely unfounded. Well, Frank fuckface McGahey, uh, he continues to interrupt, and then another audience member tries to get him to, to sit down, and they end up having a wrestling match. 
uh, right there. Other detractors start joining in. People start shouting, st- shouting stuff about Cuba. How about you know, what's going on with Cuba? Some people are yelling, trying to imitate JFK's accent, make fun of him. Large banner that had read "Welcome Adlai" uh, flips down to reveal another message behind it that said uh, "Unread Front." So some anti-communist kind of fucking message. Uh, more scuffles start breaking out. Stevenson insists on uh, staying on the stage. He finishes his speech, but then as he's leaving the convention, as police are escorting him past a crowd where people are waving signs to say stuff like traitor and communist, uh, one of these protesters suddenly flies towards Stevenson. Her, her, her sign raised high, and then she slams it down on his fucking head, hits him in the forehead, just missing his eye. He steps back under the blow, and then a clean-cut college student pushes towards the reeling Stevenson, flailing his fist. The cops and Stevenson's aides are pushing back. It's fucking pandemonium. Stevenson and Marcus, uh, this guy with them, have, have, have nearly reached the car when, when two more young men leap from the crowd. Traitor, they yell in unison. They unleash spit on Stevenson's face. Two cops wrestle one of them. Uh, another man, the other guy that doesn't get wrestled, he fucking takes off and leaves. Adlai and his staff are piling into the limo. Uh, the car Now the mob is rocking the limo back and forth. Until they're screaming at the driver, just fucking get out of here, get out of here, get out of here. And then the driver starts driving through the crowd, tires screeching as they flee away from the scene. Very dramatic. You know, so that's that's the kind of uh, uh, tension that was in Dallas just, you know, weeks before he got there. And despite this incident, and, you know, that happened against one of his, uh, you know, political allies, and recently, JFK still felt he had to make his presence known there. And again, remember, the dude was uh, brave, maybe to a fault in some situations. Uh, the first stop was San Antonio. Vice President LBJ, Governor John B. Connolly, Senator Ralph W. Yarborough led the welcoming party. They accompanied the president to Brooks Air Force Base for the dedication of the Aerospace Medical Health Center. Continued on to Houston, he addressed a Latin American citizens organization, spoke at a testimonial dinner for Congressman Albert Thomas before ending the day in Fort Worth. Uh, he has a warm reception in Fort Worth. I actually stayed at the hotel in Fort Worth he stayed at last last night he was alive just random random shit i remember seeing the plaque there a while back when i was doing some shows at uh hyenas in fort worth uh, thousands of supporters gather outside his hotel uh greets the crowd shakes some hands on the morning of the 22nd speaks to the crowd about the nation's need for being second to none in defense uh and in space for continued growth in the economy the willingness of citizens of the united states to assume the burdens of leadership and that's something that he was doing by the way too if, you, if you're really looking at jfk there's all these documents, declassified documents that reveal uh, that privately he was like, we got to fucking get out of Vietnam. We got to fucking de-escalate all this shit right away. But he was publicly kind of saying conflicting things sometimes because he wanted to get reelected is the thought there. He didn't want to seem uh, soft militarily. Well, the presidential party left the hotel, went by a, a motorcade to Cowerswell Air Force Base for the 13-minute flight to Dallas, arrive at Love Field. Uh, President and Mrs. Kennedy uh, disembark, immediately walk toward the fence where a crowd of well-wishers are gathered. They spent several minutes shaking hands. First Lady received a bouquet of roses, uh, which she brought with her to the waiting limousine. Governor John Connolly and his wife Nellie, uh, they're, they're already seated in the, in the open convertible as the Kennedys enter sit behind them. Uh, since it was no longer raining, the plastic bubble top had been left off. Uh, isn't that crazy? Man, if it just would have been raining that day, maybe he wouldn't have died. Uh, Vice President and uh, uh, you know LBJ, and Mrs. Johnson, they're in a, another car in the motorcade. That the procession leaves the airport, travels along a ten-mile route uh, that winds through downtown Dallas on the way to the trademark where the president was scheduled to speak at a luncheon. Crowds of excited people line in the streets, waving to the Kennedys. Car turns off Main Street at Dealey Plaza at 12:30 p.m. as it's passing the Texas School Book Depository. Gunfire suddenly reverberates in the plaza, and we all know what happened next. Shot rings out. Suddenly, Kennedy's clutching his throat. The governor has also been just shot in the chest, possibly by the same bullet. Mrs. Kennedy grabs JFK as he leans back, and then another shot rocks his head back into the left. It's all in the Sapruder home video. Mrs. Kennedy, she she, she looks like she's going to climb out the back of the car, you know? Which, you know, again, we kind of talked about at the top of the episode. Maybe she was just reaching for part of John's head, which is fucking grotesque, but possible. Uh, But also, if she did think there was a shot coming at her from behind, why would she climb towards it? Seems odd to me. You know, the car speeds off to Parkland Memorial Hospital just a few minutes away. Uh, but little could be done for the president, of course. He was fucking dead the second that second bullet hit him. A uh, Catholic priest is summoned to administer last rites, and at 1 p.m., John F. Kennedy is pronounced dead. Uh, though seriously wounded, Governor Connolly would recover, uh, and the president's body was brought to Love Field, placed on Air Force One before the plane took off. A grim-faced L- LBJ, uh, you know, former time suck topic, uh, stood in the tight, crowded compartment, took the oath of office, administered by U.S. District Court Judge Sarah Hughes. The brief ceremony took place at 2.38 p.m. Less than an hour earlier, police had arrested Lee Harvey Oswald, a recently hired employee at the Texas School Book Depository. He was being held for assassination of the president and for the fatal shooting shortly afterward of patrolman J.D. Tippett on a Dallas street. 
allegedly. Of course, many dispute Oswald killing Officer Tippett, just like they dispute him killing Kennedy. Critics of the Warren Report have pointed out that a number of the witnesses could not identify Oswald as the slayer of Tippett. Uh, they said people, witnesses had said that the murderer was short and squat. Oswald was thin, medium height. And, and another witness said, uh, said that two men were involved in the killing of Officer Tippett. Well, uh, Jim Garrison, the district attorney of Orleans Parish, Louisiana, from 1962 to 1973, he didn't believe Oswald was shot uh, uh, or uh, that Oswald shot anyone that day. This is a guy uh, played by Kevin Cosner in Oliver Stone's film JFK. Uh, Jim was interviewed by Playboy magazine in the October 1967 edition of the magazine, uh, the edition where the centerfold uh, and Playmate of the Month uh, was model and actress uh, Regan Diana Wilson, uh, born March 6, 1947 in Torrance, California. Her centerfold was photographed by Ron Vogel. Uh, Wilson again posed nude for Playboy uh, for the pictorial Playmates Forever in December 1979. Uh, she grew up in Missoula, Montana, along with her younger brother and sister, studied journalism at Montana State University, resided in L.A. with her husband, Barry, where they run an antique store. You might remember her from 1970s B-horror flick, Blood Mania, where she plays a very large-breasted redhead named Cheryl, uh, who gets naked for quite some time and then gets killed and then never appears in a film again. Yeah, I'm very thorough with my research, you guys, okay? Maybe not everyone would look into the Playboy uh, fucking things with that issue, but I, I did. I got I to gotta fact check everything. Anywho, in this interview, uh, Jim says the Warren Commission's own uh, chronology of Oswald's movements also fails to allow him sufficient time to reach the scene of Tippett's murder from the book depository building. The clincher, he says, as far as I'm concerned, is that four cartridges were found at the scene of the slain. Now, revolvers do not eject cartridges. So when someone is shot, you don't later find gratuitous cartridges strewn over the sidewalk unless the murderer deliberately takes the trouble to eject them. Well, on Sunday morning, November 24th, uh, Oswald was scheduled to be transferred from police headquarters to the county jail. Viewers across America watching live TV suddenly see a man aim a pistol and fire at point-blank range. The assailant was identified as Jack Ruby, local nightclub owner. Oswald died two hours later at Parkland Hospital. Well, despite Jim Garrison's, uh, Garrison's critiques of Oswald's involvement in the killing of Officer Tippett, the Warren Commission counsel David Blinn wrote, The Rosetta Stone, the key to Egyptian hieroglyphics, to the solution of JFK's murder uh, was the, uh, the murder of Officer Tippett because it proved Oswald's capacity to kill. Okay, a lot of information, right? A lot of information. My God. So did Oswald do it? I mean, obviously, I think you can tell I don't think so. I really don't. Uh, you could spend a week reading articles and books that say he did it, that give all this information, all these stats, all these facts on why it was definitely him. Yes, this shot could have happened. Yes, he could have pulled it off. He definitely did it. He was a communist sympathizer. He wanted him dead. He was crazy, blah, 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 blah. But maybe not. I don't know, because you could also spend a year watching documentaries and reading books and articles on why he didn't do it and all this proof that he didn't do it and all these people that say there was no way he would do it and CIA connection says he was definitely CIA. Uh, at the end of the day, I don't think we'll ever know the truth truly. We'll just have people say that they heard this person confess. We'll uncover documents. Other documents will emerge refuting the previous documents. New documents will then refute those. A new witness will refute previous witnesses, et cetera, et cetera, and just fucking keep on going. All we can do is look at a wide chunk of the info out there and come to our own conclusions. And here's the conclusion I've come up to. I think someone other than Oswald shot the president that day. And I can hear some sighs right now. I can feel it. I can feel your, your collective eye rolls. Right? Just, God damn it. Seriously, Dan? What? Fuck it. Really? Is that where you really do think that? All right. Well, this is the most interesting I, I came across. It's in the James Douglas book, uh, JFK and the Unspeakable. He cites one hell of a fucking source. He cites Charles A. Crenshaw, uh, one of the uh, uh, emergency room doctors who treated Kennedy in Parkland Memorial Hospital the afternoon he died in 1963. Uh, a man who disagreed very strongly uh, with the Warren Report. A man who later wrote a book called Trauma Room One the JFK medical cover-up exposed. And he said that 21 out of 22 witnesses at Parkland Hospital, most of them nurses or doctors, agreed that JFK's massive head wound indicated a fatal shot to the head from the front. From the front. One of the doctors, Dr. Perry, during the press conference announcing JFK's death at 3.15 p.m. that afternoon in a statement cited in the New York Times the next day, stated when asked about the first wound, the shot to the neck, uh, he said, when he was asked by a reporter who said, which way was the bullet coming on the neck wound at him? Dr. Perry said, it appeared to be coming at him. And then he went on to say, the wound appeared to be an entrance wound to the front of the throat. Now, some other doctors did later attempt to discredit uh, Dr. Crenshaw, uh, but they weren't successful. He, he was a noted doctor who went on to become a chairman uh, emeritus, almost said emeritus again. Ha <laughs> ha! 
I'm learning. Uh, he would be the chairman emeritus, uh, emeritus, God damn it. He would be the chairman emeritus of the Department of Surgery at John Peter Smith Hospital in Fort Worth, a department he started in 1969. So a, a noted doctor. Why would, why would a noted doctor, why would a medical staff uh, members uh, in a hospital JFK was taken to say almost unanimously that JFK was shot from the front. If the only way Oswald could possibly be responsible for the killing was to have shot him from behind, a finding the Warren Commission came to. Because those doctors have no fucking political agenda. They're just reporting on what they've examined and they're reporting that the day it happened. You know, they're reporting it before the CIA is able to fucking get to them. That's what I think. And I know that makes me sound like a lunatic a little bit, but also I think it just makes me sound logical. And then after the conclusion, the medical team who just examined him, why, why did the Warren Commission ignore that conclusion? Because they were covering it up. They were just covering it up. Uh, I think they definitely, definitely, definitely covered up a lot of stuff. So, so why did the CIA do it? Well, you know, again, I've been kind of saying this the whole time, but they'd just been formed four, 15 years earlier, 1947, what, 16 years earlier. And, uh, you know, they'd be given a tremendous uh, amount of power. In 1948, the National Security Directive gave them the power to uh, plan and execute their own missions without consulting anyone so that political higher-ups could authentically claim plausible deniability regarding their illegal deeds, deeds like, you know, killing the president, uh, in theory. Uh, and now, for the first time, a president wanted to greatly reduce, if not take that power away. That, that gives them motive. You know, you have an agency in the CIA that has been cleared to carry out assassination attempts in other nations. If those assassinations would benefit American security. And their involvement in these attempts needs to be covert. Think about that, you know? You have an organization that has employees whose job it is to secretly kill world leaders. They're trained to do that. And they do so, in theory, to protect American interests. And in the 1950s and early 60s, protecting American interests generally meant eradicating communism. And now you have a leader who appears to be friendly with communists, who doesn't want to attack communists. You have a leader, you know, who appears he wants to have an open dialogue with communist nations, to, you know, work with them in foreign places like Laos instead of just attacking them. You have a president writing letters back and forth with the Soviet leader, fucking the, the world's head commie, who's open to talking to, to Castro in Cuba, a man your organization's been trying to kill for years. You have an organization that works hand-in-hand -hand with the military. They go in, stir the pot, maybe start some shit, the military comes in, fucking finishes it. You know, like in Vietnam. The CIA were involved in Vietnam in the very beginning. Helped get some shit started over there. And now Kennedy wants to end Vietnam. Allegedly, the day before he was killed, Kennedy had said to Assistant Press Secretary Malcolm Kilduff, I've been given a list of the most recent casualties in Vietnam. We're losing too many people over there. It's time for us to get out. And if Kennedy had gotten out of Vietnam in 1962, he would have saved over 55,000 U.S. lives. Roughly 150,000 other U.S. soldiers wouldn't have been wounded. Over 1,000 others wouldn't have went missing. And the government would have saved over $300 billion to a $1 trillion, according to various estimates in terms of today's dollars. There are also numerous interviews with people working for, uh, you know, or with the CIA in like 1962, uh, who state that the CIA wanted to kill Kennedy back then over his failure to back up their Bay of Pigs invasion of Cuba. CIA operatives died that day and they felt like the president, you know, hung them out to dry. Now, did they act alone? That's what I kind of wondered. Did the CIA act alone? Were there other conspirators, people high up on one side or another in the military industrial complex who, who you know, helped uh, get rid of him? You know, because JFK, as we as you said, wasn't afraid to stand up to big American corporations like the steel companies. You know, I'm guessing he also had no trouble standing up to big oil corporations, companies that also make billions of profit off war. Both those industries work very closely with the highest ranking members of the military, men who make their name off of war. And now you have a man in Kennedy who is threatening to take all away, take all, take all of that away, take away the billions in profit, take away the glory uh, of these military leaders, you know, that can't make their name anymore on a war. I think that's uh, right there, again, more motive to fucking kill him. So, uh, so who did do it, you know? There's some mob hitmen the CIA had used before, and they're various dealing with the criminal underworld that are suspected. Uh, CIA agents are suspected. I, I don't fuck it. Who knows? Uh, on that part, I, I really don't actually care. But, but, I, but I don't think it was Oswald. I really do think it was the CIA. And if it was, uh, it doesn't matter who, who actually pulled the trigger. What matters is that we may have a government capable of doing whatever it needs to do to keep this military-industrial complex chugging along, which means that until someone else, as brave as Kennedy, comes along, someone willing and somehow able to challenge the powers that be, change this machine without being killed for doing so, we're never going to have peace in the world. Right? Not ever. That's one thing to think about. Here's another angle, though. <laughs> this is probably, this may, might, be, might make me sound the craziest. What if the CIA was right to kill him. What if not only did they kill him, what if it was the right call? You know, what if war is an inevitable fact of life? You know, 
What if it really is a dog eat dog world and global global uh, uh, peace is just an impossible dream? I don't like to think that, but I think it might be true. You know, what if agencies like the CIA are necessary? What if they should be doing all the shady shit they're doing? What if that actually is what keeps us safe? What if Kennedy had gotten elected another term and and did try to give peace a chance and it got us just fucked? You know, I, I think that's something you have to at least entertain and discuss. I don't know, man. I don't know. So much to think about. So much. Uh, and, and I hope it sparks some intense conversations amongst you time suckers. Thoughts about our government. Thought about the way we kind of live in the world. Thoughts about what happened with Kennedy. Yeah, man. So much, so much, so much. It never ends. Uh, but we're going to end it now. We're going to end it today with a quick recap of one more piece uh, and also one more piece of new information like we do now with our top five takeaways. Time suck. Top five takeaways. Number one, President Truman created the CIA in 1947 and gave them the authority to create and execute secret missions intended to destabilize foreign governments in 1948, and they may have secretly killed our own president, and they definitely could without anyone ever finding out. That's terrifying. Number two, JFK publicly shamed corporate leaders in April of 1962, threatened to give away their military contracts, and got them to lower steel prices by doing so. Will we ever have a president brave enough to stand up to big business in that way again? Or would that just get them killed too? Number three, a former roommate of Lee Harvey Oswald, uh, a man who went on to become a California judge, James Bethello, believes that Oswald's defection to the Soviet Union was absolutely a cover given to him by the CIA. He believes, as many others do, that Oswald was absolutely working with the CIA and was their fall guy. Why would he make that up? Number four, the emergency room doctors in Dallas who examined JFK minutes after he was shot claimed he was shot from the front. Why would doctors say that if it wasn't true? And why would the Warren Commission go against that finding? And number five, time for some new facts. I'm not the only person that believes a large secretive network exists, one powerful enough to kill a president. JFK himself seemed to believe it. Uh, Listen to uh, some of his address before the American Newspaper Publishers Association at the Waldorf, Waldorf Astoria Hotel in New York City on April 27, 1961. The very word secrecy is repugnant in a free and open society. And we are, as a people, inherently and historically opposed to secret societies, to secret oaths, and to secret proceedings. We decided long ago that the dangers of excessive and unwarranted concealment of pertinent facts far outweigh the dangers which are cited to justify it. Ironic, isn't it, that the man who wanted transparency in government would die in a shroud of so much secrecy. Trust no one and question everything, time suckers, including me. Time suck. Top five takeaways. Well, thanks, suckheads, for listening to the uh, the first two-parter in Time Suck History. Uh, I feel like it could have been a ten-parter. Uh, hopefully it came across as uh, <laughs> somewhat cohesive and not a bunch of just a fucking conspiracy ramblings. Uh, I'm sure there's going to be plenty of disagreement on this one. There always is when it comes to JFK and how and why he died. Uh, I'll tell you what there's no disagreement on. Me being in Orlando this week. I'll be at the Improv on June 8th, 9th, 10th, and 11th. Love that club. Uh, looking forward to seeing some fans and, of course, you Orlando, Tom, and Dan BDMs. I'll also be in Fort Worth, the last city JFK ever woke up in. Uh, I'll be there June 22nd to June 24th. Another great club. Uh, I love doing shows at. Uh, and be sure to follow Time Suck on social media at Time Suck Podcast on Instagram, Twitter, slash Time Suck Podcast on Facebook. Uh, should be releasing the first audio episode teasers for the following Monday, this Friday. Uh, be sure and share those on social media if you, if you check them out. Uh, if you want your friends to see what the show is all about, there's going to be no better way to spread the suck. And next week, we suck on some old-time American gangsters, Bonnie and Clyde. A short life of sex, murder, and robbery that led to being dead by the ages of 23 and 25. A young couple hitting up banks and killing those who got in their way, even violently breaking a gang member out of jail. Their exploits captivated a nation from 1932 to 1934. Find out why they still have some serious name recognition over 80 years after the day they died in a preposterous hail of gunfire. Reading about their lives feels more like reading a Hollywood script than it does reality. And until then, keep on sucking.